record. Uh, my name is Lyndall Fraker, state representative from District 137, which is uh, about half of Webster County and the eastern portion of Green County. The bill that I'm presenting today is House Bill 453, and it's the uh, the same bill that Representative Fisher presented last year, having to do with uh, with prevailing wage on uh, construction of public works projects. The bill basically has three parts. Um, first part is revises the definition of construction as it relates to the provisions regarding prevailing wage on public works projects. The second part revises the definition of maintenance work by removing the exclusion of the replacement of an existing facility and including the restoration of the material condition or operation or the painting or repainting of an existing facility. And then the third part defines major alteration as an alteration or structural change to an existing public facility in which the total overall project exceeds 400 square feet and is not performed by employees of a public body. Major alteration also includes renovation projects associated with road and bridge construction. The basic uh, premise of what the bill does uh, on the first part is to include painting and repainting in maintenance instead of construction. And as uh, those of you uh, those of you that were here last year, any members here in the audience behind probably were here, um, we had quite a lengthy discussion on this. And the issue that comes up, you know, is painting something, on, unless it's a new construction project, obviously if it's a new, new project, a new building, a new school, courthouse, what have you, then it, it certainly would uh, require prevailing wage. But if you're coming into an existing facility and you want to have a, a room painted, we are clarifying the statute to make sure that it is defined as maintenance and not new construction. The, um, the, the main thing, I guess, is uh, there's, there's lots of issues out there where schools um, are using their janitors or their maintenance people to paint rooms in the summertime or over Christmas break uh, because they don't feel like it's fair to have to pay for prevailing wage when um, other businesses in the community don't have to. It's certainly taxpayer money that we all want to try to protect. Um, and I'm, I'm going to speak from my perspective as, a, as an outstate representative in rural Missouri. We uh, we certainly don't pay some of the rates that prevailing wage asks us to pay if we were painting a bank or a shopping center or even our own homes. And so we feel like it's fair to to uh, include painting in, uh, in the maintenance category, which e exempts it from prevailing wage if the project is, you know, not, not brand new construction. I think, unless there's some other, uh, I missed something, I think I'm ready for questions if someone has a question. Members have questions. Good inquiry. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And as you uh, stated earlier in the testimony, this is a follow up with the bill that Chairman Fisher had last year. Pretty well, word for word. Is that accurate and saying? The final version that, that, that we had last year, it is. And I think early on, the first bill he presented didn't have the, uh, the square footage uh, rule in there or the square footage piece, but but for the most part, it's the same bill. Gentlemen, it seems, as I recall, uh, some testimony and questions last year, we sort of got hinged on an idea about water tires for one reason or another. And we were never able to move beyond that part itself. Is that what your bill is dealing with, water towers? It certainly could, but I think uh, I think you're right. I think it goes much, much further than that. The one particular issue that was talked about last year was a water tower in a certain community. And um, the community obviously wanted to be able to paint their water tower at, at, a, at a rate that they would pay, that anyone would pay but they were required to pay prevailing wage. And that's where the determination of whether it was construction or maintenance came in and started the conversation, I suppose. 
But here's the thing, and I think we got off track with that last year because everybody was concerned about a water tower requiring professionals that would have a lot of training, which a lot of times we refer to maybe um, union trained professionals or whatever. And that's certainly, certainly no question that, that they would be trained to do that. But, but that's not really what my, our bill's really concerned with. We're, we certainly feel like that if a city wants to hire a company to come in and paint their water tower, whether they're a union company or not, they should be able to pay whatever their going rate is. Now more than likely, if a guy is going to have the scaffolding and the equipment and the boom trucks and the, and the, and the, the train personnel to paint that tower, it may be a, a higher rate than what the company would be charging to paint the school. It may be a professional company that only paint, paints water towers and they may charge the same rate as what prevailing rate is. We don't know that. I mean, that's not what we're trying to, <coughs> to determine here. But that's where we got off on this bill last year as opposed to the whole premise. Obviously, uh, painting schools and courthouses and city halls are going to be happening all over the community or all over the state in all the communities. And that water tower incident was maybe one isolated incident. So, yeah, I'd like to stay away from that because that's not really what this is about. So what basically we're saying is maintaining existing structures. That is correct. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Chairman. Are there other questions for the witness? Boy, that sounded good. Representative Webb. Mr. Chairman. Um, and I'm not interested in rehashing the fights we've already had about urban versus rural and all that stuff. Um, let me just, we dealt with this bill last year, and I've read it, but it's it's, it's a compl complicated bill. I mean, it, it's got definitions in different places that mean different things. Um, the two major components, I think, tell me if I'm wrong on this, are the, the alteration of, of the definition of maintenance, primarily to include painting, and then the 400 foot uh, requirement um, under major alteration. That, I, yeah, that would be correct. Yeah. What, um, what's the what's the intent or the purpose behind the 400 foot requirement for it to be that, that existing what's this, existing projects? Uh, if the total overall project exceeds 400 square feet, um, what's the the driving motivation behind that. What, what, what's an example of the project? Oh, okay. Where would we separate? I think um, if if the capital, let's just use an example. If, if we decided that we wanted to have new wainscoting put in this room, uh, maybe because that that wainscoting or that paneling is scratched and beat up, then if the project doesn't exceed 400 feet, they could hire a local carpenter to come in and replace that wainscoting and pay them whatever that carpenter would charge you if they came to your home or to the bank, do the bank or the shopping center or whatever. They wouldn't have to pay what prevailing wage would be on that on that repair project if it was brand new construction. So it, the 400 square feet was a number that obviously was decided upon last year just to, to show that we could have small, minimal jobs that needed to be done other than paying and not have to pay prevailing wage. Okay, and we got, it always helps if we know what we're disagreeing on. And um, last year we got sidetracked with the idea of whether paint, like paying a classroom over the summer, if you had the gender or the study worker hired by the school district, had it paint, uh, whether that would require prevailing wage. Are we in agreement that that doesn't require prevailing wage? Currently? Yes. If okay. he's on the payroll. Right. Yes. He's on the payroll. Right. So, okay. I just want to make sure we were sure on the same page. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Swan. Mr. Chairman, fire, please. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Representative, I may be reading something in here and may offer an explanation that is not what your intent might be, but it would seem that for alteration projects, more than likely the
I think the 400 square feet, and, and I was not the the drafter of that part of the bill. In other words, I think the intent, though, and, and we may have some folks that come up from last year that that can testify on this, but I think the intent is, you know, a 20 by 20 area, whether that be um, a bathroom, um, I guess the surface, the vertical surface of a tower, I suppose. Um, whatever you know they had to come up a define a number though in order to, to be able to you know have have a have a, a you know a, a, a line a, a line in the sand so to speak like we do with anything else we have to have a law we have to have a rule we have to have a guideline and that was the guideline they came up with to, to be able to allow us to do these little small tiny projects now certainly you know someone can come in here and say well i want to put paneling there and that's going to be um, you know, 100 square feet, and I want some there, that's another 100, another 100, you might end up with 500 square feet. Well, I suppose if that's true, if you do it all as one project, then you would be subject to prevailing wage. So you're going to have those kinds of questions and uh, gray areas, but, but again, I guess they could also do this project today and this one six months from now. So does that clarify? <laughs> yes, yeah, somewhat. Just uh, <coughs> also to make a point that when tower work is involved, very high work comp rates, very high liability insurance requirements on the part of those individuals. So if, uh, I thought that perhaps the intent, I didn't know if the intent was here to cover vertical square footage as well as horizontal square footage. I think it would be, absolutely. And again, just to reiterate, because those, those fixed costs for those contractors are so high, more than likely, whatever he charges is going to be up there it may be even at a prevailing weight amount or rough wage amount i mean we're not trying to 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 determine determine that that's that's whatever the going rate is in that business you know concrete guys can get a lot more money than than a carpenter can per hour for what they do based on the work involved and that so you're still going to have the market determining those rates and prices thank you thank yeah. you Mr. Questions from the committee? Seeing none, are there those here to testify for this bill? Seeing none, are there those here to testify against the bill? Please come forward. Please be sure to leave a witness form. State your name clearly, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Bruce W. Holt. I'm a registered lobbyist with the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades, representing the 6,000 plus members of Painters District Council 2 in St. Louis and Painters District Council Number 3 in Kansas City. Uh, this bill, in reading it to us, has some ambiguity to it. When you take out in the first section, you specify the painting is not new construction. By the time that our tradesmen get into a building to paint, the building, we are the last ones in generally before they come in and they do the very final touch-ups of things. So by the time we get into the building, is it already an existing structure? That's one of the questions that, that we have. And in the second part, or the third part of it, we could actually be considered as major alterations the way the bill is written. In painting, was construction, now it's maintenance. It may or may not be new construction or it may just be maintenance. We have actually a lot of problems with how it is defined or how it will be defined. And in case law, when you come right down to it on the water utilities, the water tower issues, you can actually say is the latter a separate structure from the water tower rather than the tower. Uh, under the Service Construction Act, $2,500, 32 hours, or 200 square feet are actually what the criteria are for Davis Bacon. And I would like to say that we firmly believe that our people are very well trained. They go through an apprenticeship program, our cost. We train them with all the new chemicals, equipments, products that are out there. When you're dealing with water issues in particular, and I need to keep coming back to that, it is a public health issue. And 
it is a very, very serious issue to employers and employees when you have somebody down inside a tank. There are a number of things that can go wrong and sometimes do go wrong, even with just trained circumstances. So I would mainly like to say please use caution and discernment when you're considering this. Other questions from the witness? Thank you very much. I'll leave my testimony for you. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Mike Lewis with the AFL-CIO Registered Lobbyists. We all know that the prevailing wage law in Missouri is built to protect the communities and the citizens from economic disruption. And I think that when you're talking about an instance like the water tower, storm chasers are even more of a concern. When the working conditions are unsafe, I would say most of the contractors, whether union or non-union, I've met in the state of Missouri, are pretty reputable. But I don't think we can put that trust factor into the ones who may come up from Texas and bring workers with them there to be completely honest about what they feel that they're qualified to do and what they're not qualified to do. Based on that, the AFL-CIO would like to go on record against this bill. Thank you, sir. Questions? Just briefly, Mark. When you bid a contract, there's nothing that you bid a contract for prevailing wage, there's nothing that keeps that company that is bidding a prevailing wage rate from only using Missouri workers. If I win a contract and I pay higher than prevailing wage, I win, whatever, the fact that it's a prevailing wage bill really doesn't keep that company from bringing somebody in from Texas or from Arkansas. We have our school projects in Joplin. There's a lot of things that aren't Missouri workers and Missouri companies working on those buildings. So I appreciate your comment on safety and issues, but just the fact that it's a prevailing wage job does not prevent whoever gets that job from bringing in workers from outside the state. Prevailing wage deals with what they're being paid. Is that a question, Representative? Is that correct? In some cases, that is correct. But in cases like the one I just talked about, wherein someone could come from the Texas border to come up here and bring whoever with them, people who are not qualified, would have the opportunity to say they are. And then you're talking about a school district probably paying even more than they would have in the first place because they're going to run back to just like the apartment complex being built in Columbia recently with a, from Florida, a contractor brought a bunch of people up here. He owes the Comfort Inn $20,000. He owes restaurants money and he's gone. And the school district would be left with that same kind of liability. That scenario could also happen though if it were a local Missouri contractor that brought in either outside workers or just regular Missouri workers. The financial issues, really prevailing wage deals with what we're paying. Is that correct as opposed to really who they're getting? What you're paying is correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 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 Thank you
there's going to be an argument that the painter is never prevailing wage, even on new construction, for the purpose being that the facility, which has not yet been defined um, under Missouri law, is already in existence at the time. So if you have a straight out of the ground, by the time the painter comes in, there's a question of whether or not that's already an existing facility. And I don't think that, in, in hearing from what the sponsor said, obviously, I don't think that's his intent. I don't think that's the intent of this bill, and I don't think that's the intent of this body to have the painter never be prevailing wage. Um, also, we have a situation as an attorney, um, and I know there are attorneys on this panel, whenever you're changing definitions, uh, as Representative Weber said, you run into unforeseen problems or completely foreseen problems that may, maybe are only foreseeable retrospectively, if that's possible, um, which it may not be. But what we have now is definitions of construction, of maintenance work, and of prevailing hours are, have already been defined and have worked their way through the administrative process and the courts. Um, changing these things in the way that they are, I, I'm concerned that we're really restarting everything, which I've said before in prevailing wage cases, is fine for my personal practice, but I don't think it's good for the state of Missouri uh, as a whole. The last part is um, for maintenance, the way I read it, and I, again, I, I'm not sure what the sponsor and uh, what the bill's original author means, but I read it in such a way that even if it is not a new structure, that painting can never be prevailing wage. So the way I read this is, for instance, the wainscoting example I thought was wonderful, where we would be in a situation where if we have a 50 by 50 room, the wainscoting being replaced would be prevailing wage, but painting the entire building perhaps wouldn't be. And I don't think I don't think that that's good policy if we want to attract people who are coming to do this work, that we want to make sure that the big jobs are being done by people that are competitive. And to get to uh, Representative White's point, we do deal with what the people are being paid, but that's because it'd be unconstitutional for the state of Missouri to say only Missourians can do this job. The way prevailing wage does that is to make sure that Missourians aren't competing on their wages with people from lower wage uh, places and to the amount that is constitutional, do what we can to make sure Missourians are doing the work. Um, the one last question I have is major, ma the difference between restoration and major, major alteration. The example that I keep thinking of, which is going to be a fight under this bill, and by fight I mean legal fight under this bill, is if you have a situation where, say, part of a, in North County we had tornadoes a couple of years ago, number of buildings partially fell down. If we go back to do that, are we restoring that facility to its material condition or operation, or are, is that a major alteration and structural change? That's going to be something that's gonna be litigated over and over, especially if we change what a facility or facilities are. Um, and with that, I'm happy to entertain any questions. Is there any doubt in your mind, any, any doubt whatsoever, that we will end up in court arguing over what 400 square feet means? Oh, no. We are, that will, this will 100% result in us going to court to determine what a 400 square foot project area is, isn't it? Well, I, as an attorney, I'll never say 100%, but <laughs> cause I have my malpractice to consider, but yes, I mean, I, I, I find it very likely that we'll be litigating what is 400 square feet, what is a major alteration, what is the material condition. And then it's it's likely that whatever, after multiple years, we will come back to the same hearing room or the hearing room or similar to this and then have another bill defining, dealing with that court case and how that foreign square feet was defined. That's what I perceive as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next witness, please. represent 400 corporate members who are commercial, industrial, heavy, and highway contractors and industry partners in 23 counties along the eastern border of Missouri. And uh, we do not support large-scale changes to the prevailing wage statutes. We believe that they were instituted for a reason and for a purpose, and that was to create a level playing field. Um, 
if, if there were um, something that we need to consider to, to work on with prevailing wage, it would be that um, reporting is not being done. And by and large, in, in many counties, there's not uh, reporting of wage hours, which is what um, <coughs> if the local contractors would report their wage hours, um, it would not skew the wages to the higher municipality levels. And um, we just believe that uh, the bill, the, the statute as written is uh, is sufficient, and we would just uh, ask you to vote against that bill. Questions of the witness? Thank you very much. Next witness, please. Scott Ramshaw of the Plumbers and Pipers out of St. Louis. Just just to touch on something, uh, how the trades look at things. Um, as far as the building trades go, you know, we don't have the luxury of just training an individual to paint a room or just to do plumbing in a house or to to do just electrical for housing. We have we have to train our members to go from a residential all the way up to a nuclear powerhouse because depending depending on the demand of what happens of the workload in the state, we have to be able to move our manpower around to uh, facilitate what the end users and consumers need. So that's that's why at this point I'm testifying against that bill. And just for uh, informational purposes, I wanted to pass you through that sheet as far as the uh, as far as the veterans and piping program and the, and the building trades itself has on a national level. It's helmets to hard hat. So if you go to the second page second paragraph, the legislation that was passed to employ veterans in the, in the construction industry on a national level in the House was 422 to 0, and in the Senate 95 to 0, and there hasn't been much legislation that's moved to the um, United States House and Senate with that much bad support. So, and just uh, down in Cape, in the Cape area, we have three individuals that have been veterans that are employed right now. I don't have the numbers in other areas, but I just wanted to bring that on that but across the state the trades are trying to employ veterans when they come back and training is not only a value to them but the apprentices but to our contractors but to the end users and that's why training so so important to us that's why we ask to keep the prevailing wage the way it is thank you questions for this witness hearing thank you very thank much you. next witness please Hearing, are there those here who would like to testify for information purposes only? Not appearing. That will conclude this hearing. Thank you very much.